Are low-cost mutual funds, or ETFs, better investments in a tax-advantaged account? That's today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 420. Also, more strategizing from that Secure Act 2.0 529 plan provision, the pros and cons of selling a rental house now or holding it until you pass, and an easy breezy self-employed retirement account that's better than a SEP IRA. Plus, will municipal bond income bump you up into a higher tax bracket, and can you avoid Avoid capital gains tax by investing less aggressively over time. And we've got three Joes on today's show. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth. Our first Joe, of course, is Joe Anderson, CFP, along with Big Al Clopine, CPA. Um, Midwest Fabs. Midwest Fabs. From St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello again. From the banks of the mighty Mississippi River, thanks for taking the time and shedding some light on my employer match question and directing me to the video links, white papers, etc. Dedicated to the nuances of the Secure Act 2.0. Good stuff. I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> he asked you to do several shows about the Secure Act. Oh, did you send him a bunch of stuff? I sent him stuff. We talked about stuff that was available. So, yeah. So you and Midwest Fabs are like, Type buds. All of us are. We're all buddies. Got it. Uh, after listening. Between um, the ears. Between the ears. Dedicating a few shows to the nearly 350 or so pages of the Secure Act embedded within the 4,000 or so pages of the spending bill was not a top of YMYW's to-do list. My questions are about asset vehicle location. So in other words, he accepts the fact that you were rejecting his request for several shows on the Secure Act. Yeah, because there's not much there. Yeah, I mean, the bullet points you can get from Googling it, and you'll know almost what you need to know. Right. I mean, yeah, there's thousands of pages of just nonsense. Yeah, because a lot of it's a spending bill, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Right. I mean, the big things on the Secure Act is probably, you know, three or four things that we've already mentioned multiple times. You know, the yeah. RMB has changed, the 529 plan. Then there's some a lot of different changes to overall retirement plans, the Rothification of things, increased matches, you know, but it's not going to really secure every neighborhood's financial future or whatever the hell secure as, stands as, for. Yeah, as it was illustrated. Yes. <laughs> yep. It helps a little. It does. Um, if one has a choice. Between. Uh, between yeah, I, I, I got that kind of took me off there. BW. <laughs> I wasn't sure what BW means. Uh, between. B slash W. That's, that's to me, that's black and white. <laughs> I, I did Black and white I, or between? I, 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 between. I had no idea what that meant. But anyway, you're right. That's It makes sense between. If, if one has a choice of between a low-cost index fund or a similarly structured ETF, does it make a difference in a tax advantage account in which one someone should use? How about taxable type of account? Aside from expense ratios, what else should one consider when deciding which investment vehicle to use and where? Okay, there's more to this. I would think... That in tax advantage accounts, regardless on how the underlying fund is traded, capital gains, losses, dividends, et cetera, it should not matter. But choosing a mutual fund or ETF in a taxable account might not be as advantageous due to the unwanted creation of potential taxable events associated with the mutual fund. Currently, a um, uh, varietal. Varietal? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Variety? A varietal growler six pack. Really? Growler. Yep. Oh, there you go. Growler. I know what that is. Six pack from <laughs> the Steel Toe Brewing Company in St. Louis Park. Steel Toe Brewing. Okay. Steel Toe Brewing. You know them? They've got an IPA. They've got an ale. That's kind of your old stomping grounds. Probably new since you left there. Yeah. I, I grew up really close to St. Louis Park. I played them in high school. I went to Robbinsdale Cooper High School. Yeah. So, yeah. St. Louis Park was a rival. Nice. Yep. In a rotation in the basement fridge. See, basement fridge. You can tell it's from St. Louis Park. It's a little bit, you know, higher class, a little bit rich, richer neighborhood than when I grew up. We had a Got garage it. fridge. Yeah. 
So he, he likes a little steel toe uh, Brewer there. All right. Yeah. Uh, he's got the basement fridge. I also have a new walking companion uh, named by the rescue organization, Jake from State Farm, to accompany me while I digitally, di- diligently keep up with the best podcast on the interweb. This is Jake from State Farm on screen right now. Oh, oh right. yeah. Very cute. <laughs> looks, right. looks friendly. Many thanks for the simplicity, real, and funny spitball wisdom you share on the Y Dub for with the YW YMYW tribe. Why the hell do I feel like I'm drunk now? <laughs> but all that steel toe IPA. You, you've been uh, thinking about beers. That, that I know. <laughs> no, I'm all foggy brain. <laughs> Congratulations to Andy for her newly bestowed title uh, by another YMYW listener of the Boss Lady. Cheers, Midwest Fabs. Yeah, she kind of controls us, doesn't she, Jim? <laughs> she is the boss lady. Yeah, I try to keep this three ring circus uh, within the three <laughs> rings. <laughs> and you do a great job, or so we're told. Joe and I actually don't listen to the podcast because <laughs> we've already done it. Yeah, right. Uh, I could barely stand <laughs> making it through it, let alone <laughs> spend another hour listening to it. So well, I don't even know what uh, I'm, what's his well, question. That, here's the question: ETFs versus low cost mutual funds. Which is better in a non retirement account, non qualified mm-hmm. account? And mm-hmm. I would say ETFs are slightly better. To be perfectly honest, both are super tax efficient. But the most tax efficient would be an ETF because in a, a index fund, sometimes the fund manager has to liquidate funds, you know, sell stocks for distributions requested by investors. And then that means everyone gets their pro rata share of that capital gain. So you get those capital gain dividends right at year end. In an ETF, you've got far less of that because generally when someone needs to liquidate, they've liquidated their own unit and it doesn't affect you. Otherwise, and that's not like a huge difference, but it is slightly better, I would say, to have an ETF. Yeah, the structure of an ETF is a little bit more tax efficient. But if you're in an index fund, just realize there's not a ton of turnover in index funds. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's not that much different. Now, if you're invested in an actively traded mutual fund, that's completely different yeah. because now you got a fund manager trying to beat the market and they're buying and selling all the time, which causes a lot of capital gains, which you'll have to pay for. Yeah. Or unless you're in this uh, fund company that is very large, uh, the Vanguard. They did, uh, I think yeah. they changed like what to Admiral shares or they did something and then they, Every, I mean, people got hit pretty hard with the capital gain, even though they're indexed yeah. and they're very tax efficient. But uh, yeah, it can. So yeah, if you have a choice, all things being equal, I would go ETF. But yeah, certainly the fund expenses are very important. I'd rather go for a cheaper index fund than a more expensive ETF. Yep. I've got Chris from Hotlanta. Andy, Joe, Big Al. Long time listener, first time caller with a question about a Roth IRA wrinkle in the Secure Act 2.0. First, the facts. 49-year-old high earner married to a 43-year-old even higher earner. And we just had a beautiful baby girl in September of 2022. We got a little crazy at the end of COVID. We couldn't be happier first-time parents. Does this sound familiar, Joe? Hey, now. (laughs) That's getting Pretty close to home, huh? Yeah. Oh, my God. We're, <laughs> we're blood brothers. <laughs> yeah, little COVID I, babies. I feel know? like I know Chris. Yeah. <laughs> he, he does a little podcast uh, down in Atlanta. <laughs> uh, yeah, very similar kind of situation here. He's a little bit older than me, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> By a year? God, baby, a Negative six months. <laughs> Mitch. Yeah, Chris is an old man. See, I'm young and spry. <laughs> Especially with those two kids in the house. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. Year and a half. Time goes yeah. by. It know? does go by fast, doesn't it? No. Yep. I drive a 2014 Toyota 4Runner Limited, and my wife is a 2013 Audi A4 Quattro. Our drinks of choice is a cold Miller Lite for me, a vodka soda, or a gin and tonic for the missus, or a nice glass of California Cabernet if we are feeling fancy. Uh, we have about $1.2 million in a rollover traditional IRA, $300,000 in Roth IRAs, $250,000 in a Roth 401k, twenty-five dollars in our HSAs, and $200,000 in a brokerage account or cash in 500 k 
in investment real estate equity. I'm always looking for more ways to get our dollars into Roth accounts. All right, <clears throat> reading up about the Secure Act 2.0, there's a provision that addresses flexibility on 529 plans that I believe might be another opportunity. From the article, a concern among parents saving in a 529 plan is the chance their child chooses to skip college or the funds may go unused. In this scenario, parents can pass the account to another beneficiary or withdraw funds for non-qualified expenses, resulting in income tax and a 10% penalty on the earnings. When 2024 rolls around, parents will have another option. A secure 2.0 provision allows the tax and penalty-free withdrawal rollovers to Roth IRAs from 529 college accounts that have been open for at least 15 years. There's also a $35,000 lifetime limit on these transfers per account beneficiary, plus a few other limitations. I've already opened in seeded, seed funded, well, seed funder, huh? A 529 plan for my daughter. My question is if I can open two additional 529 plans, one for my wife and one for me, and fund them each with after tax dollars, they would then grow tax free for the next 15 years. After that point, could I then either transfer them to my daughter? if need be, or could we just convert them to Roth IRAs for my wife and me keeping in mind the 35,000 limit mentioned above? When, if we don't need them in our lifetime, my daughter would then inherit them at some point down the line. Is this a viable strategy? And if not, what am I missing, Chris? Sounds like a lot of work for really not a lot of benefit. Well, yeah, because of all those limitations. And, and so the $35,000, you can't do all in one year. You're limited to the amount that a Roth contribution or traditional IRA contribution would be, which right now is $6,500, right? So anyway, you could do that. You know, when you're over 50, you can do $1,000 more. So $7,500. So you can do that every year. You have to have earned income. So both of you would have to have earned income and when you're in say your 60s or close to 60s in the case of your wife. So got to have earned income to do this. And it would count against any other Roth contributions that you would otherwise make. You can't do both, right? Oh. You do one or the other or a combination. So I tend to agree with you, Joe. It does seem like a lot of work. And then probably if you fund it over 15 years, depending upon the market, you might overfund it. And <laughs> I don't know. So it's a little tricky, but the concept and strategy is just fine. But yeah. there's limitations. So, yeah, he could fund his, his wife, and then his daughters. And then if he wants to transfer or change beneficiaries from him to his daughter, if the daughter needs a little bit more cash, if not, he can roll it. But the limitations, if he's trying to use a creative Roth strategy, this is not the case for Chris. In 15 years, is he still going to have income? And if he is why wouldn't you just directly contribute to the Roth or do the back door or do any other type of thing versus transferring the 529 plan? Cause the transfer counts as a contribution, just like Al said, you can't like double dip or you can't put the $35,000 all in at once. It's a lifetime maximum contribution to the Roth of 35,000. That's why I said, it just kind of seems like, all right, now I got these other accounts that I got to monitor and keep track of when potentially I can, probably just make the contribution. Yeah. I mean, I guess one advantage is you put the money in now and then it grows tax-free. And then, so you have a higher amount to transfer, but still you're limited to that currently $7,500 a month. It's, now it's not even available currently. You know, I think it's 2024, maybe when this starts, but yeah, I personally would not do it. I, I agree with Joe. I think it's a bit too much effort for what it's worth. All right, Chris, congratulations on the little one. Maybe we get together and get the kids together and have a Oh, play date. Oh, yeah, little, little play date. It's so much fun. <laughs> Secure Act 2.0 is a circus. And just for Midwest Fabs and everyone else that's been asking about this new tax law, we've got a brand new YMYW TV episode and a brand new companion guide to prove it. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app to go to the show notes, watch that brand new TV show, download the guide to the Secure 2.0 Circus, and to see that picture of Midwest Fab's walking companion, the very cute dog named Jake from State Farm. It's all in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Got Bobby. Bobby from Philadelphia writes in. 
<clears throat> Philly. You ever been to Philly, Big Al? I have been to Philly a couple yeah, times. Yeah. yeah. But Brotherly Love, you like uh, it? Yeah. I do like it. I saw, let's see, the Liberty Bell and all the all the stuff there. It was It was fun. All right. Okay, Bobby, thank you for the show. I learn a lot listening regularly on my daily commute. I'm 45 and live outside of Philadelphia with my wife and two little boys under seven. We are pretty boring when it comes to cars. Chrysler Pacifica in a Honda Accord. Yeah, that is pretty boring. <laughs> If you don't say so yourself, huh? Drink of choice is a local brew like Dogfish Head or 60 Minute Brewing, or is it Dogfish Head? Dogfish Head 60 Minute IPA. Yep. Oh, there it is. So it's all one word Dogfish Head 60 Minute. Well, Dogfish Head is the name of the company, and then the beer is called 60 Minute IPA. Oh. Dogfish head is so and, Andy's got the picture up on the screen. It looks like it's in a black bottle. I mean, black label uh, right. with a black little case carrier for the six pack. Yeah. It's dogfish head, man. Yeah. Over the last 20 years, my wife and I have been using a buy and hold strategy to build an income portfolio held in our taxable accounts that will cover our expenses in retirement. In this way, we hope that our post-retirement income will continue to grow and keep pace with inflation without having to withdraw from our principal. All right, so he's building an income strategy here, Al. He just wants to live off of uh, interest and dividends. Don't touch the principal and just hold on to this thing. Sure. I expect the portfolio will generate $150,000 by the end of this year. Hundred and fifty grand of income. He's 45 years old. How big that's, of a bully do you think that is? It's high. I mean, even with high dividend paying stocks, it's got to be up there. What do you get? I don't know. I mean, unless he's going <laughs> I mean, really crazy on the risk and trying to get like seven to 10%, like, you know, dividends. I mean, the yeah. dividend yields right now, what, three or 4%. So that would be what, three to 4 million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the first comment is. Sometimes when you have a high income portfolio like that, that you may be taking on more risk than you realize. Could be. I mean, if he's got 5 million bucks, then I think he's in line. But if he's got a lot less than that, it would be interesting to see what he's doing. Right. 150 grand, but at, man, at 45, good for him. Yeah. You bet. Um, got no debt. We're fully funding 401ks, IRAs, 529 plans for the boys. I don't know when exactly we'll retire, but could be in the next few years. Our portfolio is comprised of a diversified group of 80% dividend growth stocks. Ooh, there it is. <laughs> dividend growth stocks, not just dividend stocks, big guy. Yeah, dividend and growth. Dividend growth stocks. 20% individual municipal bonds. I invest myself because I enjoy it and because I believe I can mirror the results of the dividend fund so he can beat the manager. Bobby from Philly. Yeah. He's got well, the secret sauce. May, maybe he has, if, if he can generate 150000 of income. He's highly diversified, but he could get a better yield. All right. Good for you, Bobby. I yeah. only invest in stocks that have a long history of growing and stable dividends, and I limit exposure to any individual stock to less than 1% of the portfolio income. For the muni bond part of the portfolio, I only buy bonds rated A and above. And I only hold bonds through maturity to limit my interest rate risk, okay? Part of the reason I invest in muni bonds is to limit income taxes when we decide to retire. I'm shooting to keep my dividend portfolio of our income below 115000 so my tax rate on qualified dividends will be 0%, and my tax rate on ordinary dividends will be around 22. My understanding is that $115,000 is the top of the income level where I can qualify for 0% tax on qualified dividends. This, of course, includes the standard deduction for our family. Thanks for hanging in there if you got this far. You're welcome, Bobby. <laughs> guy's just patting himself on the back all the way through this. <laughs> My actual question is about taxes. Then why don't you just ask it? You just got to go through this diatribe of how great you are at picking dividend stocks and you can beat managers. Yeah, uh, yeah, I digress. I, I need a blackfish tail 60 
Rude. You need a, you need a couple of those right now, Joe. I do. <laughs> uh, since any bond income is not taxed at the federal level, I believe I should be able to stay in that zero percent tax bracket for qualified dividend income as long as my taxable income stays below that one fifteen. Am I thinking about this correctly, or could muni income contribute to taxable income and bump me up into a higher tax bracket? Thanks for the show, Bobby and Philly. Thank you, Bobby. Great question. I really enjoy the question. Um, even if it did make him cranky. <laughs> did make me cranky. Bobby's from Philly. He gets it. Yeah, he, it's just being human, right? Yeah. <laughs> just having uh, a conversation. Yeah, he's sitting around having his little black fish, and he's like, yeah, and he's talking to his buddies about how great he is at picking stocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my portfolio. How's your portfolio? Oh, <laughs> uh, really? Mine's going to produce about $150,000 in dividends. Yeah. Yeah, what's your dividend rate? Yeah, what, yeah, what's your dividend yield? I don't know, maybe a couple thousand. Well, yeah. mine's one hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, have you ever heard of the fund S C H E? Yeah, I, 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 I can do be better than that. I can do better than that. <laughs> all right, so he, he's building a portfolio. So, th- besides all of that, he's building a portfolio that he can live off of. But I don't know why he's doing it the way he's doing it, and maybe we can get into that later. But let's just answer the question. Is that all right? So he's got municipal interest, and sometimes municipal interest could be an add back, you know, maybe, you know, when it comes to calculating certain taxes. So he's trying to stay in that 12% tax bracket because if you stay in the 12% tax bracket, then capital gains or qualified dividends fall into that 0% cap gain rate. So he doesn't necessarily have to pay taxes on that. So if he has that municipal interest that could be pumping or, you know, added, let's say, another $10,000, does the capital gain sit on top of that? Or is that not even included in the overall taxable income calculation? Yeah, great way to frame it, Joe. So municipal bond interest is not includable in your taxable income. And you are right. It is includable for some modified adjusted gross income calculations right? But not in this case, not for taxable income. So the way this works, and there might still be a little confusion by Bobby. So let me kind of explain this. So what happens first is your ordinary income is kind of the first level, right? Any ordinary income that person has minus the standard deduction is kind of your base. And then capital gains sit on top of that. And as long as by the time you get to total taxable income and it's below the, in, it currently 115,000 because you subtract 25,000-ish of standard deduction, you get about $90,000 of taxable income, which is the top of the 12% bracket. Then as long as all your income is capital gains, it is uh, 100% tax-free or qualified dividends, 100% tax-free to the extent that any of those are ordinary. So they would be taxed in the, if they're above the, let's say the standard deduction, they'd be taxed at the 10% rate or 12% rate. Yeah, because you're right. I was confused with that too, because he's like, my qualified dividends will be 0% and my tax rate on ordinary dividends will be around 22%. Yeah, so I, I think he's thinking, Joe, maybe that, First, he does capital gains that are at zero, and then any other ordinary dividends get taxed at 22. It's actually a better answer than that. Right. Yeah. This is a good reminder for everyone that capital gains will always sit on top of ordinary income, not the other way around. Yeah. So do your ordinary income first, minus your standard deduction or itemized if you itemize. So you come up with whatever that is. You add your capital gains to that, and all the way up to, in this case, after you've actually $90,000 of taxable income, all those capital gains as well as qualified dividends are taxed at zero. Anything above that, if it's capital gain or qualified dividend is taxed at 15%. Right. So his qualified dividends would start first and then his qualified dividends would sit on top of that is what you're saying? Yeah. Ordinary income, ordinary dividends first minus standard deduction and then capital gains and qualified dividends sit on top of that. Got it. Okay. Yep. So that's how that works. So probably instead of 22% for his ordinary dividends, it'd probably be, I'm guessing 10 or 15%, depending upon the the level, unless there's a lot of them. Right. But I don't think there are, because I think he said the total income is 150,000. Yeah. But then he wants our expected portfolio to generate $150,000 by the end of this year. Yeah. But then he's trying to control that to get it to 115. So it'd be interesting to see how he's going to do that. If it's, you know, because he's so good 
It's just well, raining he would, more income than he, he could, needs. Well, he could do it with muni bonds, but that might reduce his rate of return, right? Or let's see, he could switch to some growth stocks that don't have the dividends, which that's a whole other discussion, which we don't have time at this point to think of a total return rather than an income only return. Yeah. I mean, I think we've talked about that um, quite a bit on the show is that we love dividend paying stocks. Don't get me wrong, but just having a sole strategy of just focusing only on high paying dividend stocks to us could be a little short-sighted. Uh, yeah, and, and you might be you... taking on a little bit more risk than you think, where you can potentially create very similar income, but you create your own synthetic dividend, like Warren Buffett, right? He never necessarily wanted to invest in, in dividend paying stocks because he didn't want the company to force the dividend out where he would potentially have to pay tax on it. He would want to control his income by creating a synthetic dividend versus having the company distribute it. Yeah, and you do that by selling some of your shares and then it's long-term capital gain. Same impact, but you're in more control. And one one more further point, Joe, is the large growth U.S. companies have done very well the last 10 years. They're also the highest priced. So based on how you think about that, they could have a little more risk than other types of stocks. No one knows for sure, but that's possible. And then dividend stocks, everyone's been searching for dividend return. So I've got to believe that dividend high U.S growth stocks are, they're probably the highest priced right now. But he's got it under control and, he, and he's doing a really good job. So uh, congratulations. Yeah. If he, I mean, if you really love this stuff and you enjoy it and you watch it, you know, by all means, go for it. From a tax perspective, I think he, he's going to be sitting in an even better spot than he thought. So yeah, agreed. Thanks for the question, Bobby. Uh, let's say we got Joe from Ashton, PA. Hey, Big Al, new dad, Joe and amazing Andy. Yeah, oh, about a year and a half new, but yeah, that's that's, that's still new compared to me. Yeah, oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening for many years and truly appreciate the continuous education you provide in the awesome humor derails. I drive a 2011 Honda CRV. CRV have a Yorkie poodle named Guinness and drink all liquids. <laughs> all right, cool. I appreciate the virtual invite, Big Al, to this nice bar in Hawaii to do some spitballing with you guys. Oh, the Maui. Well, I'm here right. I'm here right now. I so know what, you are. What island are you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. The Mai Tais are getting to me, so I hope this capital gains question makes sense. You got a Mai Tai yet, Big Al? Today? I uh, no. All no, right. No. In fact, I've been here. This is the third day. I haven't had a drink since I've been here. Well, what is wrong with you? Yeah, really? I'm just, you know, taking a break. Trying to make sure you can answer the questions. <laughs> well, I mean, well, you were in New Zealand for a month. So uh, yeah. you have a lot of New Zealand ale. I did. Oh, all right. <laughs> so yeah. this is this is a little reset. Yeah, I got it. You know, after yep. a little vacation, you need a you need a vacation from your vacation. You do. That's yeah. right. I know who you're with, so I would imagine there was a few cocktails that went down. You know at least two of the people I'm with, and yeah. so, it, yeah, you have a pretty good idea. Yeah, I have a really good idea. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's let's get uh, back to the Mai Tais here. Situation. Someone has aggressive 401k investment mix, 90-10 stock bonds for 30 years, and then sales, sells most of the stock mutual funds and moves the balance into bond funds within the 401k. If the rebalance is now 2080 stock bond, it will remain this way for two years prior to retirement. Do those 30 years of mutual fund capital gains ever get paid to the government as taxes? Is this a legitimate strategy to avoid years of capital gains taxes if you plan to become less aggressive in retirement anyway? The company has never passed along extra fees to employees but this seems to be a tax due to the individual. With a balance of several million dollars, this could be significant savings when one starts withdrawing in a few years. Maybe this leads to a general question on how capital gains taxes are paid from 401k accounts. Is it only when they are sold in taking as withdrawals, not sales within the 401k plan? I hope this question makes sense. My head is spinning from the drinks. No idea how Al slams my ties and provides financial spitballing. Have a great summer, gang. I have the money outside of my 401k, but wanted to simplify my question, I hope. 
Thanks as always for taking the time to educate us. Yeah, he's had way too many Mai Tais. Yeah, I, I, a, a couple, couple too many. You're missing one basic fact here. So yeah, so when you buy and sell within a 401k, there's no current taxation, right? So no capital gain tax to pay. However, when you withdraw the money, it's taxed at ordinary income. So what could have been a cheaper tax if it was held outside a retirement account is taxed 100% at ordinary income, which by the way, every time you take a dollar out, you pay ordinary income tax rates. And by the time you're currently 73, you have to take the money out because of required minimum distributions. So yes, the government will get their money. They'll get more than they would otherwise get because it's not capital gain, it's ordinary income. It's a much higher tax. So the only benefit is you can rebalance inside a 401k and not pay current tax. But believe me, you're going to pay a lot of tax as you pull the money out. Everything is tax deferred in a 401k account, right? So you start with $10, it grows to 10 million. There is no tax on that growth until you start taking distributions from the overall account. If it's outside of the retirement account, well, then that's when you have capital gains tax. So let's say if you're rebalancing along the way, you could have capital gains, you could have capital losses. So when you're investing in a brokerage account, it's completely different from a tax perspective on how you want to be looking at that on an annual basis than if it was in a 401k plan. Because it's a set it and forget it for a 401k, or you could trade all day long. You could day trade the hell out of it, and you're not going to have any type of tax advantage whatsoever within the overall account. You're getting the tax deferment. There is no tax at all until you take the distributions. That's when you're taxed at ordinary income rates. Most people are in a lower tax bracket in retirement, most. I'm not saying you are and not saying most of our listeners are probably in a different tax bracket in retirement. It's probably higher because they're listening to this podcast because they're interested in financial education and they're doing things about their overall financial life. Most people don't necessarily save, right? And so when the 401k plan was, you know, I guess born in 1974, you know, the top marginal rates were in the high 70s, mid 70s. The top marginal rate in the history of the tax code was in 90%, right? Now it's almost at its lowest. So there is no taxation along the way, but when you pull the money out, you will be taxed. And so you might be in a lower bracket or you could be in a higher tax bracket. So you just want to understand the taxes as you're building and accumulating wealth and then creating the income. Thanks for the question, Joe. Keep drinking those Mai Tais, brother. How capital gains tax and ordinary income tax work and the best strategies to manage them are regular topics here on YMYW. Podcast episode number 325 compiles many of those discussions for cap gains versus ordinary income tax explained all in one episode. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app. Go to the show notes and find episode 325 in the big fat list of free financial resources available right before the transcript of today's episode. And if you want Joe and Big Al to spitball your your plan for your retirement, your taxes, and your overall finances, just click Ask Joe and Big Al on air there in the show notes and send them in as a priority voice message or as an email. Joe from Chula Vista writes in, we are seniors, 73 and 80, with a 55-year-old son who is single. Uh, we are debt-free. Have three rental houses in Arizona. We'd like to know the pros and cons of selling the rental houses now. All houses are paid for. We are thinking to unload them because of our age. Thanks. Why would they uh, just the probably the they don't want to have the maintenance of it? Yeah, I think so too. I mean, uh, I get it. You want to simplify when you get older. From a tax standpoint, you're actually mm -hmm. a little better off if you you hold them until you pass, because your son will get a full step up in basis and can sell them with no taxes. But that may not be a re realistic. Maybe you don't want to manage. Maybe you can have your son manage him if he's going to inherit him anyway. Maybe he would be motivated to save the taxes if he doesn't want to and you really don't want him. Yeah, you can property sell. Manager. Yeah, yeah. you hire a property manager. But if you still want to sell because you want to simplify, you don't want to deal with it anymore, I, I would understand that. You're just going to have to pay capital gain taxes on the gain on sale plus depreciation recapture. So the taxes will be probably higher than you're expecting. Yeah. So then the son that is going to inherit it all will probably get less. So if you want the son to get more, but if the son needs it now, he's 54 and single. I don't know. Yeah. Does he need the cash now or can he wait another, you know, 10, 15 years? Whatever. Yeah. Or on, on the other hand, maybe 
one out of the three is more of a problem than the other two, you sell that one to get rid of it and have a property manager or your son manage the other two so you don't have to think about it. That's what I'd probably do. All right. Thanks for the question, Joe. We got uh, Steve from Las Vegas writes his deposition again, Big Al. <laughs> the, the way he writes it kind of looks like it's a deposition. Very kind form- of expect an attorney's signature at the bottom. <laughs> very, very formal here. Okay. My daughter and son-in-law need an easy breezy retirement account to put away some self-employment income. I told them to check with a local bank, re a SEP IRA. We see that my discount broker also offers SEP IRA accounts. Is there something better than the SEP IRA for them? That the idea is a retirement plan that is cheap and quick to set up and maintain no employees, IRS schedule C. P.S. Is there a show about SEP IRAs in the YMYW show archives? I looked, but I couldn't find anything. Now listen to YMYW online on news radio. AM 600 Kogo, San Diego. I drink a tall glass of water and I use public transportation. Love the program, Steve. Uh, Steve. So I don't have a full episode that's about the SEP IRA. There's questions about it all throughout. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll need to do a compilation episode at some point all about the SEP. Don't we have like a, we have a TV show on retirement accounts. Yeah. Then we have like, don't we have like a white paper on all the different retirement accounts too? There's a white paper that's on all the different types of IRAs, and I think we actually have a blog post about self-employed small business owners' different options for retirement accounts. Huh. Okay. So I will link to all of that stuff in the show notes. Got it. Perfect. He needs a he needs a solo four hundred and one k. Yeah, that's the be- that's the best. It basically it's the same contribution amounts as a SEP IRA for the employer part. But the employee part, you don't get in in the SEP, but you do get in a solo K. So you can put a lot more away with a solo K. I would say, Joe, from simplicity, they're both very simple. There's one little extra nuance with a solo 401k in that you actually have to have a plan document, but the brokerage houses have them already made. So you get kind of an off the shelf one. It's super easy and you do have to close it out when you're done with it. But besides that, yeah, that's usually what we recommend for the main reason that you can put a lot more in it if you want to. Yeah. Solo 401k, just Google that. Most of the discount brokers have the solo 401k because you get the employee and the employer, right? Because the son-in-law and daughter um, are the employer and employee. Right, because right. they're self-employed, so they can kind of get both sides of the table here. Yeah, and it ha- it has to. You have to have no employees, which they have. Let's just say they just an easy example. They make forty thousand dollars of income. So with a SEP IRA, they could do twenty five percent. So they could put ten thousand away. Okay, with a solo four hundred one k, they could also put ten thousand away for the employer part, but they could put twenty two thousand five hundred <laughs> for the employee part which if they don't necessarily need the tax deduction, they could put that in a Roth, which is a great thing, particularly if they're young for growth. If they need to live off of it, if those amounts are just too high, then you can keep with a SEP because it's super simple. But when you want it, when at the point where they want to put more away than just the 25% of the profits, then yeah, I definitely go solo K. All right, Steve, Hang out, uh, have fun on that uh, public transportation there in Vegas with that cold glass of water. Um, is that this is the end of the show. That's the end of the show. This is We're it. Done. We're done. Well, wow, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> all right, that's it for us. We'll see you all next week. The show's got your money well. Find those links to both the blog on small business tax strategies and the ultimate IRA guide in the podcast show notes. We've got a quick comparison of fridges in the basement versus the garage in the derails at the end of the episode, so stick around. Help new listeners find YMYW by telling your friends about the show and by leaving your honest reviews and ratings for Your Money, Your Wealth in Apple Podcasts, as well as any other podcast app that accepts them, like Amazon, Audible, CastBox, Good Pods, Pandora, Player FM, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, Podknife, Spotify, and Stitcher. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advice. Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 and schedule a free financial assessment in person at one of our seven offices around the country or online at a date and time convenient for you no matter where you're
where you are. Chances are one of the experienced financial professionals on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure will be able to identify strategies to help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Basement fridge. Tell us from St. Louis Park. It's a little bit, you know, higher class, a little bit rich, richer neighborhood than when I grew up. We had a Got garage it. fridge. Yeah. <laughs> Got you gotta it. go to the garage to get the cold beer. Not right. The... Right. But I think, actually, I think about it, we might have had a, a, a fridge in our basement, too. Did it? Well, there you go. That was like for frozen meats, though. I think it was a freezer. Like you put right. a freezer in the basement, you put a beer fridge in the garage. Got it. Well, if if you lived there now, I bet you'd have a one in both places. <laughs> I would have a fridge <laughs> in every room. <laughs> if I lived in Minnesota now. Yeah, right. Oh God, I would you'd, have a liquor cabinet in every room. You'd have to. You'd be inside for <laughs> six months at a time. <laughs> uh, you're like, what happened?